Thank you to the council for hosting a very important debate at a very, very important time in our state and our nation's history. I'm running for Congress because Congress has got to do more and can do much more to help us fulfill our potential as a country. I'm running for Congress because Congress can and must do much more to make sure that hard work pays off. And I'm running for Congress because Congress can and must do much more to bring us together to embrace diversity and embrace inclusivity and stop sowing seeds of division. At the heart of it, that's the American dream. For all of our imperfections, that is the path that so many have been able to walk. It's a story of me growing up here in neighborhoods along Old Baltimore Pike and along Route 4, the son of a Newark police officer, the son of a public school teacher, who worked very hard so that myself and my three brothers would have more opportunities than they did growing up. It's a story of my wife, Liliana, who's here with us tonight, who was born in Vietnam. Oh, please feel free to speak. <laughs> I was born in Vietnam and moved to the United States at the age of five and settled in San Jose, California. And she, along with her three siblings, were raised by very hardworking parents, a pizza delivery man throughout her entire life. Her mother made clothing at markets and sold them before getting a job assembling biomedical equipment. Again, working very hard fitting into the fabric of our country, and simply wanting more opportunities for their children, and they were successful. It's a story of so many of you who have worked hard and overcome so many challenges at a time in our nation's history when that was the American bargain, the dream was in the reach of so many people. That's what this election is about, fundamentally. And I don't know if we all would have predicted it many, many, many months ago, but that's clearly what it's coming down to at this point as we grapple for the soul and the future of our country. And that's why I'm running. We've got to restore that American bargain. We have to make sure that American dream is in the reach of so many people who are willing to work hard for it. And the set of challenges that we face from the economic, from an economy that has been reinvented so quickly, with so many people now feeling on the outside looking in, whose skill sets make it difficult to participate. We're an economy that is not guaranteeing fair wages for those working hard. An education system that has not kept up with that change to make sure that we are teaching each child based on his or her own unique needs, unique interests, to empower him or her to make sure to have that self-confidence to be able to grow, grow throughout life. And a criminal justice system where the outcomes are so much more based on the color of your skin or the size of your bank account. These are very real challenges we face in our country. And what's unique about my candidacy for Congress is that for the past several years, I have been leading on these issues in Dover, trying to right the wrongs inherent in our laws and trying to achieve fair and more just outcomes in the community. It's why I have the support of groups in Delaware ranging from our teachers, the Delaware State Education Association, to our labor leaders embodied by the Building Trades Council and the Teamsters, the Delaware's engineers, the Delaware Stonewall Democrats, a group committed to inclusivity and equality. Because these are very tough issues that we face in a country at a very pivotal, pivotal point. We're working together, coming together, embracing diversity and inclusivity, and not being, allowing ourselves to be driven apart by such hateful rhetoric. That is how we're going to be able to ensure that those Americans who want to work hard, of every background, of every religion, of every skin color, have that opportunity. We can do it. I've seen it through hard work in Dover, how it can be done. And with your support, and the support of so many Delawareans, I can make sure to take my story and Liliana's story and your story down to Washington, D.C. to make sure that so many Americans are able to have that same kind of story and reach the American dream. Thank you all very much. When I was running for state senate in this district back in 2012, I was challenging the highest ranking state senator. And nobody asked that question, quite frankly. They wanted to make sure that you're someone who understands the issues, is going to be willing to work hard to understand the issues, that's going to represent the district well, that's going to be very transparent, going to be accessible, going to work hard. That's the real measure of qualifications for the office. In this instance, we have the incumbent who's running for governor, so it's not a matter of challenging that sort of experience in terms of time in office versus not. But really, it's a matter of understanding the issues and I think that it's not just a matter of understanding the federal issues as federal issues. It's extremely important to understand how they impact Delaware. 
how if you pass a bill at the federal level or target funding for a program at the federal level, how it impacts Delaware and how state legislators, county councils, mayors, city councils, all have to then work within that framework to try to achieve good outcomes for Delaware. That's what I've seen so much of the past four years in the state senate. Working and actually pushing back against the federal level where the testing and fanaticism wasn't serving our students very well. Trying to work to make sure that we had federal funding come to Delaware alongside infrastructure funding. Really understanding how those levels of government come together and align or overlap to achieve good outcomes for Delawareans. In addition to that though, what I'll say is, I do believe, and we've seen many Del Delawareans say the same thing, and in fact for many decades we've seen Delaware really want to make sure that we send someone to, D to D.C. who has some left experience first. This is a legislative seat in Congress. The role of the legislature is extremely different from that of an executive. The role of the legislature is extremely different from that of a staff member. It's very important there in that caucus room talking to your colleagues, even Democrats who might not agree with you on issues that most of us in this room I think would agree on, like gun safety, that we've addressed in Delaware successfully. State Representative Edozinski is here. He led the effort on closing the Charleston loophole. I was proud to be the Senate sponsor of that. Having those tough conversations with your own colleagues, the same letter next to your name when they don't agree with you, and figuring out how to work in that kind of diverse environment is something that our next congressperson really has to have, given how important the seat is for Delaware. In addition to that, I know we asked many questions in one, but I guess I'd say that we all know financial services is where the congressional seat has had its assignment for a long time. It's a very important industry to Delaware. It's also a great platform to try to work on financial empowerment for marginalized communities, on successfully deflating the student loan debt, the loan bubble. So there are big issues you can address from that seat that are very important to Delaware and to all Americans, and I look forward to doing so effectively on uh, financial services. There definitely has to be partnerships at all levels of government, but given the nature of the gun safety issue in the U.S., the federal government has got to step up. There's got to stop being in this gridlock. There's got to be stopping this inaction. You can go from tragedy to tragedy to tragedy, and then just sit back and wonder who Congress people are serving given their tremendous failure to act. We've made progress in Delaware on the state level, and that could be helpful. I'd say any law that makes it less likely a tragedy will strike here is one that we should be promoting here in Delaware. But the reality of the ability of guns to move across state borders is the exact reason why there's got to be a federal solution for this. Universal background checks at the federal level to make sure that guns don't move across state lines. Targeted law enforcement facilitated at the federal level bringing in jurisdictions from across the region to make sure that guns aren't trafficking across state lines. An end of the prohibition on research on gun violence from the CDC to make sure that we can address it effectively for the public health crisis that it is. Federal funding, like the Violence Reduction Network funding through the city of Wilmington, to make sure that our policing is being done in the most effective way possible. We have a tragedy here in our own state, particularly in the city of Wilmington, but there's gun crime all around. There are things that we can do there are leaders that have stepped up, and there's more progress that we can make. And coming into the State Senate just in the wake of Sandy Hook, and seeing multiple, multiple bills be crafted in the months that follow, some pass, some not, some be this close but fail because of imperfections in the bill that we can address and need to step up on. And knowing all of that needs to be taken to the federal level, that we can't allow the NRA to be the only strong lobby on this issue. We've got to foster those other groups that are rising up now in the wake of these tragedies to make sure that other scorecards are put out there. Those legislators who are willing to tackle this issue, those who aren't afraid of big money interests that have been very successful in stopping progress. As we do that, we can gain ground, we can insist on responses to the tragedies that we see every week, every month in our country, and we can make sure that Americans do not have to live for fear of daily gun violence and as mass tragedies that strike. It can be done, it's hard work. I've done it at the state level in coordination with my colleagues. I look forward to doing the same at the federal level. There's a few items. It starts with our children, no doubt. And I didn't know these questions would be asked, and I know you'd be here tonight, but I'll point back to State Representative Edozinski again. Uh, he and I did a bill this year in June that expanded the flexibility of school breakfast for children. You have to have different options for them because some are coming off a bus or heading right into the classroom they need to grab and go. Others have the time or the inclination to sit in the cafeteria with their, their classmates. You have to have flexibility to make sure our children are well fed and prepared to be educated. And making sure that eating habits are reflected in our school lunch menus, school breakfast menus, are very, very important. Expanding programs at the Food Bank of Delaware, which is in the Senate District here with us, which is a national leader in all kinds of innovative programming, is critically important. 
Also, I'd say we've got to do a much better job of tackling food deserts. Food deserts are the inavailability or inaccessibility of healthy, nutritious foods, often in communities that are impoverished. It's very difficult to walk and find access to healthy foods and to know how to prepare them effectively. This has been talked about in our targeted programs, and I've worked with in the Food Bank of Delaware, but we need to do much, much more uh, in that way. Any issue you can point to has a federal state overlap. We've done work at the state level here. The federal level often has an overlap more in funding as opposed to legislation. One thing I'll say as well, though, and echoing Lisa, feel free to go to all of our websites. Any statement you hear about the only person with a plan is probably inaccurate. We all have websites with a lot of these issues that are, that are addressed. You can see our positions very, very clearly, as well as over time, seeing us be very accessible and transparent on Facebook. If you don't want to go into legislative record, you can at least see how we comment on this and try to be leaders in the community voicing these concerns. <coughs> but with regard to trying to stop diabetes, and by the way, there's a host of different medical care issues we can get into as well. I think the root of the problem is the habits that we've developed, and the best way to address that is making sure that healthy eating habits and the availability of nutritious foods are available to our children.
That transition is going to mean we've got to rewrite our laws at the state and federal level to really facilitate that. Whether it is healthcare, where you have businesses that want to grow and expand but might find themselves in an entirely different healthcare framework. Whether it's the kind of tax incentives or uh, the kind of investment grants that we decide to give out. Two years ago, I insisted the Delaware Economic Development Office be put through Sunset Review. The point of Sunset Review was simple. Are we analyzing the bang we're getting for our buck? Are we talking about why we don't give more loans to Delaware small businesses rather than grants to out-of-state companies? I can tell you that that kind of outreach didn't make me very popular with the governor's office, but a lot of constituents said those are the exact kinds of questions we have to be asking, particularly after what happened with Fisker. Delaware's gone through a tremendous transformation, and we do have opportunity right now. We do have room for optimism. In particular, University of Delaware has an application in right now to be a national leader putting to use all the great science and research talent that we've lost at DuPont. We can strike at this moment, and hopefully in the coming weeks that announcement is made, and hopefully it's very positive for Delaware. So we do have opportunity. I'll say two, two or three additional things. As chair of the Senate Banking and Business Committee the past four years and seeing the finance industry and seeing how much high tech relates to the finance industry now, it's very important to understand the trends that are going on there. As a Delaware attorney that's represented Delaware businesses big and small, I've seen the concerns that go on as managers and employees talk about the challenges they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis and making sure that we're making it easier for them to focus on the job they're doing to benefit the community. And finally, I'll say as a millennial, I understand very much how important it is that young talent wants to come to Delaware, or even more importantly, young Delawareans want to stay here and grow here and start their own businesses. For many, many years, we've had a brain drain. When I chose to go to the University of Delaware coming out of Glasgow High School, I remember how many of my friends from Glasgow and Newark High and other schools decided to go out of state. It's always kind of a little bit of a pain when that happens here in Delaware, but it happens all the time. We all know that. We've got to make sure that there are all kinds of reasons that young people want to come here, stay here, invent new businesses, grow new businesses. That's what we've done a lot of in the past few years. It's what we need to do more of in connection with the federal level. Um, these are all very, very important issues. The idea of picking one of those countries as the biggest threat, um, I think, doesn't do service to how important the issues all are. Although I will say that what connects the three most problematically uh, recently is their willingness all, Russia, China, ISIS, to reach into the U.S. to take our data, to expose conversations, to put at threat the fundamental aspects of American economy and American society, to put at threat privacy. <laughs> which is so much at the heart of America. We've seen it in different ways from each of those entities over the past many months and the past few years. As we struggle how to defend against that, we get wrapped up into a conversation as Americans, a very important one, one that we shouldn't avoid, about that trade-off between liberty and protection. There are very, very serious issues, not just on the cybersecurity issue, not just on nuclear proliferation. There's a whole host of issues, but what's just very alarming to see in each of these entities in very recent times, disrupt America in very fundamental ways. We have got to strike back against that. We have got to make sure we come together as a global community. We've got to push back against what we see from many people in our country and outside our country about departing from multilateral institutions that are more uniquely prepared to combat these global threats. Working with Congress people in Congress, insisting that we maintain a commitment to these global institutions, and engaging the American public in these very difficult trade-offs, and hearing your voices on what balance you want us to strike in these tough decisions, is extremely important if we're going to be able to prevent these series of invasions that we've seen in the past many months from Russia, from China, and from ISIS. Foreign policy challenges in the Middle East and in the Muslim world, 
more broadly. Um, I'll note, I'll start by saying that, um, although Professor, Professor Khan said that Donald Trump's speech was irrelevant and possibly it was, it doesn't mean it's not impactful. And his words and his rhetoric and his, 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 the fear that he's spreading is really causing a huge divide in our country that cannot be healed quickly unless people step up equally loudly about the importance of inclusion, the importance of diversity. To your question more fundamentally, Professor, what I would say is, is that um, let's, we need to acknowledge how broad the Muslim world is. It's not just a small little point in the Middle East. It has, and I think has always been, and always will be, a key, key part of our entire global community. And that includes the United States now. And I think that's what makes tonight's debate and the engagement of the Muslim community here in Delaware over the past many months and several years is so important. And it has to continue in that direction so that people's conception of Muslim issues is not something different from America. And I think that is at the heart. And I've been honored the past several years to work closely with the community, whether it's having a resolution in Dover that acknowledges the Eid festivals and their importance, whether it's attending iftar dinners, whether it's grieving the loss of one of the brightest stars of the community falling. Making it very clear down in Congress to my colleagues that Muslims are Americans, that they have tremendous contributions to our shared community. And that on that basis alone, if we embrace that, if we promote that, we have already won over those who want to seek a different framing in our world. And working very closely with Muslim Americans on the different forms of outreach that we must have across the globe. There is not just one perspective that governs all countries that are considered Muslim countries. There's a lot of diversity, a lot of internal challenges, a lot of different approaches we have to take in different regions around the world. I look forward to doing what we have not seen, I think, enough of in our Congress, certainly in recent years, when the word Muslim was meant to be derogatory. But rather, we should use it to embrace the diversity in our country and be very clear about strength in that diversity of perspectives from across the globe that we find here in our community helping us point to different policy <coughs> challenges from Saudi Arabia over to Pakistan and India, up to Turkey, throughout Europe, and into the United States as well. That perspective is not one that I have, or probably I think that any of us have. It's the perspective of the shared community that can help us do much better in messaging the importance of Muslim Americans to our country and ultimately to our world. sounds like a reputation for at least a brief response. <laughs> what I would say to that is, again, the idea of only candid plan, only candid this, really kind of influences how you hear how the rest of us talk. What I would say is, on the day that I announced my candidacy, September 17, 2015, the very first question I was asked by WDEL in a radio, in a radio interview is how you would have voted in Iran, on the Iran deal. The very first question, right out of the gate, I said that I would have voted to support it. There is no doubt that there are atrocities happening. There is no doubt that there are unacceptable, <coughs> unacceptable human consequences of what's happening right now in the Middle East. It has been for some time, and we must find a way to end it immediately. We must begin efforts immediately to find a way to end it. We have to have peace as a focus. We have to have a two-state solution as a focus. And I will say that, just like when a question is asked right away, when you announce a candidacy at the federal level about the Iran deal, given how timely that was, one of the immediate questions you're also asked is where you stand on this issue. And I'm very proud to say that I stand with Israel, but I also think it's important to be very open and honest in dialogue about the path that we've got to find a way to forge forward together. There's no doubt that a two-state solution takes Palestine and Israel working together to figure out those terms. But it can be supported by the international community. It seems it must be pushed by the international community to happen. I think that there's a few things we have to do in regards to the specific part of the question about empowerment. Not only economic and empowerment and opportunity for those Palestinians who truly want it, but also finding a way to engage Palestinians in civic structure building. Because right now their leadership, I don't believe, is playing by the kinds of rules or the kinds of values that are going to actually serve Palestinians well. And on the other side, when you have such hardline rhetoric from Israeli leaders, that quite honestly does not match the, the, the rhetoric and discussions I've had with leaders in Delaware's Jewish community. It is not productive. And when you have settlements that are growing in these contested areas, it's not productive. 
the issue of military aid is not one that we should only look at with regard to Palestine. I think we have to take a look at it in the broader region as well, because it's about Israel's defense. It's about helping to make sure that our strongest ally and a country that stands for so many of the same values that we do, for all of its imperfections and all of our imperfections, is able to defend itself. I think what we see, and the trend that we see, is a very sad extension of the military industrial complex that we see all across our country and in many ways all across our world. Where if we are going to sell arms to Israel's neighbors, as we do, then there's no doubt we then have to make sure to sell Israel even more sophisticated weaponry to be, weaponry to be able to defend itself. I don't see how that is a winning situation long term. Yes, it's very important to make sure that our strongest ally in the region is able to protect itself, but we've got to do whatever we can to make sure that we embark on a, a path towards discussions about peace and the two-state solution that so many people in this room and throughout the world have been waiting so many years for. So it's a very hot button issue. You can stand with Israel but insist on an end to the kind of rhetoric, the kind of action that is making a two-state solution more and more impossible, and do whatever we can do to navigate to that form of peace. <laughs> Obviously, one of the most important questions that we see every single day in terms of language that seeks to divide us as a people. Um, but what I would say in terms of how you ask the question is that these movements, these conversations, these cries for equality and cries for acknowledgement, um, they represent inequalities that have been happening for so long. It's not that the inequality just happened and now people are talking about it. It's that for so long these things have been happening and now there's a critical mass that every single day talks about it. As sadly we see every single day more and more tragedies happen. For those who are very deeply concerned about this, just pause and think about what must have happened so many times before we had cell phone video cameras to show us. And then think about the fact that even though we have cell phone video cameras now, it still happens. Your question talked about Black Lives Matter, it talked about Islamophobia, it talked about anti-immigrant rhetoric with regard to Mexicans. Those are all such important issues that deserve their own answers. What I'll say very briefly is, I don't understand what people don't understand about saying the word Black Lives Matter does not mean you don't think all lives matter. It means that you... It means that you are acknowledging the chronic and consistent and tragic and unacceptable, always has been, always will be, disparities across so many aspects of American society with regard to African Americans. We know that exists. We have passed legislation to try to address it, specifically within the criminal justice system in Delaware. At the federal level, there's bipartisan efforts to talk about criminal justice reform, but we've not seen enough of it this election year. Hopefully there's still that sentiment heading into next year. On the Islamophobia side, I'll just say there are so many impressive members of Delaware's Muslim community and all their contributions to Delaware every single day and to America's Muslim community. And the Islamophobia that Donald Trump promotes, the idea that this should be about a religious test instead of a character test, is extremely un-American. As to is the idea that immigrants have not always been and always will be one of the most beautiful parts of America. The diversity you can see in this room, if you're one of the three of us standing up here, is inspirational. The story that I get to enjoy every single day with Liliana, and a hard-working pizza delivery man who made sure to fake it, doing eighth grade math that he did not know, but he wanted to make sure his daughters thought he did, <laughs> so that they would do the work homework each night, is inspirational. This is who we are as a people, we are imperfect individually, and we are imperfect as a country. And these conversations, all threads of them, are so much of what this election is about. <laughs> Essentially, all millennials can identify with student debt, myself included, Liliana included. 
For us, it's a matter of making that decision to go to law school, which is a tremendous long-term commitment to the loans you have to take out. But more and more students are having to take out those same kind of loans for undergrad or two-year degrees. And that's extremely problematic. There is a tremendous amount of intergenerational inequality going on right now. We have got to tackle that, not only because of the ethical implications, but also the financial and economic ones with the hugely inflated student loan bubble. But more to the point of your question directly about trade schools and the role there. I don't know when it happened, although I had a sense when I was in high school at Glasgow, that if you didn't go to college, you weren't a success. That's not the way it should have ever become, and it's not the way it can be moving forward. There's a whole lot of things that we have to do to make this work and to kind of dig out of the hole that we're in right now. One is making sure to empower young people with skills when they're in the K through 12 system, especially the 8 through 12 system, where it becomes more and more clear those who are interested in activities or in professions that are much more aligned with the trades rather than going to college. And that's okay. We have to make those offerings available. We have to have a conversation with Delaware. It's a long conversation about a deep problem in our state, which is how schools are structured. I remember when I was at Glasgow, we played hot and Votech and lacrosse. And the sense of what it meant to play a Votech school is very different from what it means to be in a Votech school now in Delaware, where a whole lot of kids go to college out of Votech, sort of one in a profession for sort of a certificate of some sort before going to college. That's not what the point of the, the, they, they were supposed to have. We've got to do a much better job of making sure those kids who need to have those kinds of offerings and develop those kinds of skills have the seats, have the slots to do it. Those are honorable jobs that pay very well. And it's all part of that bargain where if you work hard, you will be able to succeed. It's very different we're not giving those kids those slots, K through 12, or making sure they have real opportunities coming out of 12th grade to go to community colleges or other programs where they're going to be able to get those skills. It's very difficult for us to tackle this when we're underinvesting in infrastructure in the first place. Where a lot of those skills that aren't able to be deployed in the economy because we're not building our country anymore. It's very difficult to do it when we're not investing enough in R&D. And so that 21st century manufacturing transition that we're in the midst of isn't happening as quickly and smoothly and successfully as it could for American families. And then beyond the K-12 system and beyond that community college, there's also the issue of adult learners more generally. Programs at the Delaware Skill Center, which I visited several months ago, fantastic to see people come in over the course of several weeks or several months, be able to develop new skills, and be part of a current where they're able to get a job placement right away. That idea that when you want to work hard and you want that job, there are going to be offerings, educational and otherwise, for you to do it is so critical to making sure that more and more people have that sense of possibility in our country. Where if you work hard, you're going to have an opportunity to succeed. I think very little demonstrates that issue more than the issue of skills and the trades in our current economy, in our current education system, in our current society more broadly. There's a whole lot of that we've done in Delaware, but we need to do more of at the federal level as well to really solve this issue and make sure that people who want to develop those skills and have employment opportunities do have it.
that becomes a very real problem. One of the problems also is what's going to happen if TPP does not pass. And this is something that should weigh on anyone who is really serious about serving in this kind of serious seat. That if we don't pass it, the question becomes what does China do with regard to going after those countries that could have been part of this partnership and now aren't? Is China able to let, use its leverage regionally to develop trade deals or trade relationships with those countries and actually isolate America from the region more? That's one of the negative consequences of just genocide the idea. And in, when you sit in the legislative seat, I'll tell you, there are plenty of times a vote comes up and you're not 100% voting yes or 100% voting no. It could be 51-49, 60-40, 80-20. You have to make a decision of one sort or another. And the issue of TTP, sorry, TPP is yet to be played out this year in the current Congress with President Obama. I think there's no doubt, moving forward, we've got to make sure that we have fair trade that works for American families, American workers. It's the way it was supposed to be. That's what voters and workers deserve.